join us, we're going to do Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, do I have a motion to approve tonight's agenda? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Agenda is approved. We'll move to presentation uh, by Ms. Dan Danielle Falk from the Community Prevention Initiatives Coordinator. And welcome. Come on up. Hi, Amy. I'm not no, you're not. That's okay. You get me instead. I'll take you. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, all right. How Introduce yourself, Amy. I know. Okay, I just want to make sure this is on. Got it. All right. Good evening, everyone. Sorry, I had to compose there. Um, uh, my name is Amy Masechko. I proudly serve as the health and wellness coordinator for the Talawanda School District, and in that capacity also serve as the director of the Coalition for a Healthy Community here in the Oxford area. I am here tonight with several of my colleagues, and we are very excited to um, bring back um, some updates to you uh, regarding our mental and behavioral health work, the projects, the partnerships, and the investments that we are um, collectively working together to make within the community. So I am going to um, share uh, the time here with um, my colleague and introduce some of our other um, consortium members who are here uh, with us this evening as well. So uh, this is the introduction to them. This is a, a, it truly is a collaborative. And we have, um, not, we have just recently named ourselves the Hope Cooperative. Um, and the idea of through this work, through collectively um, coming together under, um, under this grant, but with common goals, um, common objectives, uh, common passion for our community, uh, we are, uh, in, in uh, intentionally bringing hope to the community. And so you can see here members of this cooperative as part of these grants you had to um, apply as such, but we are so uniquely positioned in this community that we've been working together for so long already um, that it just um, has been a perfect fit. So um, from, um, we have McCullough Hyde Foundation who uh, we'll be talking about serves as the fiscal uh, sponsor for this uh, grant. From Miami University here, we have uh, Rebecca Baudry Young, the Director of Student Wellness, who is um, the representative from Miami. From McCullough Hyde Memorial Hospital Tri-Health, we have Amanda Reibold, um, who serves as the Director of um, Wellness and uh, Physician Relations. Um, and we have Talawanda School District, Epiphany Community Services, who serves as our uh, evaluator, providing technical assistance and support uh, for the grant, the coalition as well, and then the Butler County Mental Health and Addiction Services Board. So the first HRSA grant, we were here about a year ago, I believe, and sharing with you um, what the work that was happening out of that. HRSA standing for Health Resources and Services Administration, um, an arm of the federal government that really seeks to provide equitable services um, to geographically isolated communities, such as our defined rural community and other vulnerable populations. We were proudly awarded um, a $1 million grant back in 2020, over three years, and there really the purpose was three phases. We needed to build these connections, bring this consortium together. We needed to build capacity around the work because this grant was intended to address prevention, treatment, and recovery from substance use disorders. The Coalition for Healthy Community has been in the business of prevention work since 1997. Um, and so we felt good and we knew best practices and, and what, what worked in our community. 
uh, treatment and recovery was new territory for us. So we really needed to understand, dig into the research, what were the best practices, how, how do we provide that access in a rural community. And so building that capacity in programs, in understanding, in knowledge, and then finally delivering care. And we are so very proud of the work that we were able to accomplish over this three year period. Just some brief highlights. Social emotional learning, um, uh, you know, bringing um, social emotional learning programs to Talawanda through curriculum, assessment tools, mindfulness training, really helping our kids understand the skills, the healthy um, relationships, managing their emotions, how to feel and show empathy, all of these things that are so critical and we know serve as protective factors in keeping our students safe um, and, and healthy. One of my um, favorite uh, stories from this is in the mindfulness training we are doing in our schools. We're, help, we're um, providing training for our staff to deliver these three minute, um, it's called Calm Classroom. Um, some you know stretching and breathing and and mindfulness activities and um, one of our local physicians reported back to us that uh, a, a little one was going in to get a vaccination and right before they were very nervous and they said I need to practice my calm classroom and they started doing their breathing which you know it's not just a school thing right we're teaching a life skill and that's our goal harm reduction and prevention I can't thank you enough as council and city staff for your support of uh, over a year ago for um, endorsing the uh, establishment of an SSP, uh, a syringe service program here in this community. We are saving lives. We are getting people to treatment. It has been a tremendous success. So thank you for your willingness to say yes and um, take that risk because it has benefited folks in our community. We continue to collaborate with the Regional Harm Reduction Collaborative in the Butler County Health District to now have other um, harm reduction sites. So another one here in the city limits, but we're also um, really building up the one in Somerville at the Somerville Community Church, which has been a tremendous outreach uh, for individuals um, there and, um, and other communities uh, nearby. So thank you for that. Our hospital-based peer support, another program that really came out of this where we are engaging peer support specialists. They have lived experience with substance use and they um, are available on site um, three days a week or via telehealth in the emergency department at McCullough Hyde. If an individual comes into McCullough Hyde and presents or shares a, a substance use disorder, a struggle with addiction, they can immediately be paired up with this individual um, and it's, it's their choice, but that individual will walk with them um, through their journey um, you know, for up to a year and support them along the way. We have seen tremendous uh, support um, coming from these, these individuals um, and this was not something that our community had um, available prior to this grant. So again, our, with some data collected from this grant just from the first three years, 2000, or 2020 to 2023, um, you know, we've, ser we've served over uh, 4,800 people, utilized over 30,000 volunteer hours, made over 2 million uh, media impressions. Again, whether it's the wellness room at Miami University for our students, whether it's new lighting at Parkview Arms that the residents asked for and said would benefit the, their community, uh, medication disposal, um, and making sure that you know we're over we're at 1.5 tons of medicine we've collected at this point, um, and our very robust mental health guide in the community. Um, all of these projects are a result of this collaboration, the whole cooperative coming together. So. This leads to our next one that we are currently in. And for this, I am very proud to introduce um, Charlie, um, who will be uh, sharing a little bit about this for us. Thank you, Amy. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Charlie Musanski, and I am lucky enough to serve as the new project director for this uh, current second HRSA grant, or HRSA 2 as we call it, um, that we're working on as a cooperative right now. 
And I also am lucky enough to also wear the hat of working at McCullough High Memorial Hospital in the Community Relations Department. All right, so Amy did a great job of walking you guys through um, the first kind of phase of the Hope Cooperative with that first grant. And right now um, we are in our second grant period. So the second grant period started in 2022. And this time we were lucky enough to be awarded $2 million. And it's also a four year period. So we're also, um, we're continuing to address many of the important issues from the first grant, such as substance use disorders and behavioral health, but we are lucky enough to now expand the scope to mental health and mental health care as well, because as you know, those overlap so much. So we're very lucky to do that. And this also expanded the geographic area in which we were able to um, have our programming as well. So um, as you can see on the slide, our geographic area is within the Talawanda School District. Uh, but I do want to emphasize that it's not just the student population. We also want to work with adults, seniors, um, and we also have specific goals for Miami students as well. Uh, but with this grant, we are lucky enough to expand to more of the rural areas as well and some of the townships. So we also have three main cooperative goals with this four-year grant. The first is to reduce barriers that are going to naturally occur in more rural areas. Um, we want to increase access to behavioral health care and mental health care. Um, the second is to really work with the communities to create um, sustainable programming. So we are using evidence-based practices and working with established organizations like the coalition that have been doing this work for a long time because we wanna make sure that we're investing in sustainable practices in the community. And then the third is to improve capacity. And this is really looking at um, the social determinants of health. Okay. Just to give you an idea, um, and this is just a small kind of portion of what was accomplished in that first year from 2022 to 2023. Um, with the help of the community, the police departments, the Coalition for a Healthy Community, in Oxford, uh, we've collected more than 2,000 or 2,000 pounds, or 1.5 tons of medicine, and safely disposed of that. We were also lucky enough to hire a community prevention initiatives coordinator in September, and Danielle has been working with the townships, um, collecting data, and really working with them to find out what they need and how the Hope Cooperative can help create sustainable changes for them. We also are lucky enough to expand into Somerville. So a lot of the harm reduction that Amy was talking about with getting resources, Narcan, um, connecting the community members, we are doing that in Somerville and we have community connections. So we're able to um, provide these services in all types of weather. So we're very thankful for that as well. The Hope Cooperative is also continuing to financially invest in the social services liaison with the Oxford Police Department, which is just, she's amazing. Ashley Weddle is, is great with the community and is doing so much, so we're very proud to support her. Uh, we also, as Amy has said, with your support, we have been operating the syringe service program in Oxford, and I'm lucky enough to go and to see the relationships that are made and to hear from individuals who have gone through the program and got resources and gone through recovery, um, it's just really impactful. So again, thank you so much for that. Uh, we also financially invest in Miami University in telehealth rooms and psychology clinics as well. And they're just a great partner. So we're proud to invest with them. To give you a snapshot of the first year, and this was just kind of getting started. So it's ramping up even more in year two, but we were able to serve more than 1800 people provide more than 500 hours of community service and make 240,000 media impressions. To give you an idea of kind of the goals and the projects that we are continuing to work on and that will be completed kind of by the end of this four year term is we are working and continuing to work on our anti-stigma campaign. We address substance use disorders um, because as many know, stigma is a huge barrier to getting treatment and access to care, but we are expanding into mental health messaging as well because stigma is impacting mental health care. We are also investing in telehealth um, community rooms and telehealth equipment, and this can be used, of course, for mental health care, but it can also be used for things like um, 
job interviews or anything that community members feel as if they need. We want to really meet community members where they're at. And then finally, we also are putting resources into retaining mental health care workers in the community because we really value the work that they do. Um, a, a few last things on this last slide. Um, we are expanding our harm reduction sites. We have a new site off of College Corner Pike that has just begun, so we are very proud to be working on that, um, especially looking at the data and where it's most needed in the community. Uh, we are looking at transportation gaps because that can be an issue in rural communities, how individuals can get access to care and access to transportation. Uh, we want to continue to work with community groups. We want feedback from you all. We would really appreciate that in the Q&A section. And then we also, of course, value our law enforcement teams, and we want to invest in them, um, safety trainings, whatever they need um, as well. Oops. So again, I just want to thank you all for listening to us and having us here and just for your support. Um, we value it a lot. Um, and with that, I will open it up to questions. And we have many great team members here that hopefully can answer anything that comes up. Thank you so much for a great presentation, and you kept to the time, so that's really good. That's excellent. Well done. Um, does anybody have any quick questions for this group? You're doing wonderful work, and I know because I see it more, but I think all of our counselors appreciate everything that you're doing. I have a question. Yeah. First, I'm, I'm excited to see the synergy that's happening from all the different parts of our community with law enforcement and McCullough Hyde and and even at Miami now in the Wellness Center. And um, this is a question for you, Amy, with regard to social emotional learning. At one point, I just feel like in the news, it felt like there, was, there were community members, it was national, that were really uncomfortable with social emotional learning in the schools. Was that something that impacted your work here in Oxford at all? Parents or being upset yeah. about it? or um, We have, have uh, been able to uh, introduce programming in the way that we've done it through okay. curriculum and and and, um, and sharing it with our students, and we have not received pushback that That's has great. has had made us you know stop the yeah. services. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, Dave? Well, I just this is I always love to see the connections. You know, I'm on your site. And it points people in the direction of food resources like TOPS. It, it points in the direction of BCRTA and free bus routes and dot. So like where the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts is really nice. But it takes people making all those connections. Because like you say, it's not just one thing. It's like right. if you don't have transportation to the service, you can't get the service. So uh, it's hard to do this holistically. But it seems like you're, you know, you're trying really hard. It seems like it's working. So thank you for thank you. making those connections. And I appreciate the work with our police department and our social services. Yeah, we appreciate the yeah. partnership very much. We appreciate that. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very us. much. All right. Thank you for allowing us. Okay. Our next item is a notice to legislative authority. It is a transfer of a liquor license. Does anyone want to make a motion? I make a motion that we receive with that we comment? received notification. Is that what we're receiving? Yeah. Typically, we receive without comment unless you have comment, then you get the. No, I'm always curious what's going on. You know, <laughs> but you know, we, I'm seeing addresses move back and forth. I, but we, I notice it. You know, we see. Yeah. Doug, do you want to comment on? Well, that? it's just a change in ownership, and uh, we had a question, staff about this small end of the basement. <laughs> I, they've never served liquor in the basement, but that has been on the license for several years. So uh, Sam had our code enforcement officer check on that. And so it's just <laughs> on the restaurant level. It's uh, used to be called Wild Bistro. I think now it's Sushi King. Uh, so, okay. There's been a motion made to receive without comment. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Thank you. And now we'll move to public comment. And anybody who would like to address council about items that are not on our agenda tonight, or if they're on the consent agenda and you'd like to talk about them, uh, this would be your opportunity. Come forward, 
uh, give us your name and where you live and for the record, and then we'll give you up to five minutes. Good evening. My name is Steve Chaffin with the 6022 Fairfield. Last council meeting, there were several speakers that discussed public participation at council meetings. And there was discussion about transparency and information related to the fire EMS issues coming up. In discussing these issues with a member of council, a former member of council, and one of the citizens that was at the last meeting, I would like to present a proposal to council. This proposal would add 23 words to Rule 10, the council's rules. This rule is a formal, the formal process where citizens come to council and present matters of concern. However, there's no specific provision for citizens to ask questions or to receive answers. While there may be times when questions are asked and answers are given under the existing rule, I believe this amendment would make it more clear that citizens do have the right to ask questions and expect answers. I don't think it's unreasonable the language I present does not require an answer at the time of the meeting. It could be done at a later date. Apparently that is a practice that does happen occasionally. As the mayor has pointed out to me, this is done. And it, it, if that's the case, then this rule wouldn't affect that at all. We're not deleting any language from the existing rule, just adding some that allows us opportunity for questions and answers. I think it's important the public know they have a right. It's not just something that's granted the council, but it's something that, that the citizens can expect to do. So I hope you'll consider this, put it on the agenda, and have a debate. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate you coming. Is there anyone else who'd like to address council tonight? Okay, thank you. And uh, as always, if any councilor decides they'd like to introduce legislation or promote that, um, you have that opportunity. Um, we'll move to the consent agenda. I would entertain a motion to approve it. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any items to be removed? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. It is approved and we'll move to resolutions and you can read the first one. A resolution to adopt the 2024 measurable action items to progress toward comprehensive plan goals. Okay, is there a motion to adopt the resolution? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Jessica, welcome. Good evening. I'm going to try to pull up a little bit here for you. So hold on just a second. So on, uh, while you're doing that, page 52, if you have your agenda. Actual resolutions on 350. Good evening. Um, we had a council work session where we talked about what action items did we want to achieve this year. And what I want the public to understand is that planning actually began um, in January, February of 23, where um, this research and planning begins. Oh, did I do it again? And then um, we bring it forward to the budget and it's built into the budget. And then we start working on um, then we start working on what we're going to do this year. So we council has an opportunity to say, did we get it right? We built some things into the budget, but also what else did you want to see? And I do not know why ClickShare does not like my computer, but um, let's try it one more time. There we go. And I also want the public to know that when we report on our council goals, we, we share them on the website. You can go to the government city council annual goals, and there is a, a Tableau site here where you can see you know, a January 24 update. You can see kind of the progress meter of what's going on on all of the goals. And if you want to, you know, select into different categories, you can to kind of narrow it down. And when we adopt these um, action items for 24, 23 will be moved down. You know, it'll still be there for people to go look at it, but this will have the list of 2024 action items here. So it's a way to kind of keep our eyes on that comprehensive plan and make sure that we're kind of advancing those action items. Um, before you tonight, I do have kind of the feedback that we think we heard from you, and I'm not going to go through all the goals because there's a lot, um, but I am going to go through the ones that maybe had a slight modification. Does that sound okay? Right. 
Otherwise, I think we'd be here a long time. Um, so the first one here was, um, you know, can we see a full transportation plan update in 2024? And the staff response is, with the new um, interior spokes planning on the trail and also the um, um, preliminary route alignment, that, that's a really big one. Also with the implementation of the trail projects that we have going on, we would recommend moving this to, um, oh sorry, transit corridor design and then also the access management policy are going to occur in 24. We would recommend letting that occur in 24, then in 25, adopting a full new transportation plan. And there's also new guidance from ODOT and possible funding for this type of adoption. So that would be our recommendation there. Then um, the next one here is about, um, we have, there were some comments on expanding the recycling program, so I'll talk about that in a minute. But we did add a goal about zero waste events that I'll note there in a minute. We did add this one in response to council request, which is research, develop, and adopt an EV charging infrastructure requirements for new residential and commercial developments. So that was a councilor request. On this one here, um, council. You don't know what page those are on, do you? Ooh, on our, this is part three of the. Because it's kind of hard to find. Yeah, they're not page numbered, but I think that's we're now on the bottom of three. I think it's fifty-seven. My apologies. Oh, it's in the agenda. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Me the, go whole, back and look. The, the whole thing is in the agenda. Yeah. Me, I I'll try to go along with it on the page number. I'm in 25. Let me get to the year 24. <laughs> That's what I'm looking at. I think I found this one. Did you one. find it? At the bottom of page 57. 57. There it is. Yep, page 57. So there was input from council on um, requiring multifamily and commercial recycling. And um, a, the Environmental Commission had looked at both zero waste events and multifamily and commercial recycling. And their recommendation was to do zero waste events in 24, which is actually a council idea for 25. And so what staff is recommending is that we try to do zero waste events in 24 and then do, again, more research on, and try to implement multifamily and commercial recycling in 25. So we're, we're recommending a flip-flop um, with the input from the Environmental Commission. And of course, if you don't like these, we can change it. I'm just bringing forward kind of our ideas here. Then the next one is we had um, our goal to to update chapter or part 11 of the code guidelines and also update our historic guidelines. With counselor input, we added milestones into that. And that is on page 58. 58. You can see that that's going to be almost a two-year process. So when we say that one line is going to take a lot of time, it, it really will be quite a, a long process, but a big goal to ach achieve. Okay. Then we had, um, let's see. Page 62. Page 62, now you're with me. I am. Um, we had <laughs> added in a uh, response to council request um, that we would, during the um, annual analysis and update for the city's infrastructure inventory, we would identify specific street segments that are candidates for resurfing, resurfacing, and we'll also incorporate bike and pedestrian safety improvements um, based on the recommendations of OPTAB in time for that capital improvement planning. And so kind of looking at more than just street resurfacing, but where does bike and pedestrian access also need to be in investigated. So we'll be added that. And then here we, um, 63. Thank you. We expanded uh, based on council input um, that we um, were looking at trying to solarize the city facilities. We, we put out an RFP. We had one response. Um, and so it just was really expensive to do. And so now we're looking at, let's try to find a grant to do a feasibility study to solarize city facilities because it's going to cost more than what we had anticipated. And so that's, that's what this is about. And we already Super. have a outline of a federal grant ready. 
um, that we're looking at in partnership with OKI. And so that is definitely built into that. And so we'll, we'll learn soon if we're gonna be able to add that on to that grant application. And then these next few are added in with um, counselor request, which is um, explore and develop funding concepts for cold shelter programming. Um, develop a new format for screening community assistance requests from the city budget and inform community partners of the new process. And then we have update short-term rental language to limit secondary use or explore the use of a moratorium until new language can be adopted, which we already started this evening. So those are our proposed action items for 2024. We will give a report in July on how we're doing toward the progress on these goals, and then we'll give another report um, again in January to see how we did. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions or take feedback if you want to see a different change. Thank you very much. First, we'd like to see if anyone from the public would like to address this resolution before council. Okay. Um, councilors, do you have any comments or questions on this fine report from Jessica? Good job. Yeah, I have a... I'm glad to see a lot of things that we brought up reflected there. I, um, I was pleased to see the One Mind initiative that OPD plans to participate in. I looked it up and it fits with the presentation that was given earlier today just for our officers getting trained on mental health, crisis intervention, and for I think 20% of the officers will get directly trained in that and then the other 80% in mental health first aid. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add, Chief Jones, to that. Seems like Oxford's already made the pledge to complete the One Mind program. Yes, thank you. So we took that pledge a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. It's part of the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Um, efforts to improve uh, law enforcement response to uh, folks experiencing mental health crisis. So we took the pledge a couple of years ago and we've pretty much achieved most of those things, but we need to kind of get over the ledge and. Um, like finalize it back with IACP, make sure we have the right number of uh, individuals trained and make sure our response policies reflect what they want. So there's just a few things outstanding. And so I wanted to put it in the council goals to, uh, to uh, make sure we finalize it. Because like I said, we've been working on it for a while, um, but I wanna actually be able to report back to IACP that we've completed it. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chief. Any other questions for Jessica? So um, not a or question. Comments. Yeah, um, not a question. Well, just a comment. First, I just uh, this is a really nice change. We've been evolving in our annual strategic planning process, um, and this is the first year we have a comprehensive plan to guide that. Um, and why that's significant is because in the past, when we were trying to decide what was the priorities, it was things that staffers felt were important or we felt were important, but it was hard to know whether those things were also important to people. And so what's really great about a comprehensive plan process and why it's worth the money, I think, is we now have a template for what the people think we should be working on. That doesn't always, like the people don't know everything that a city needs to do and, you know, and, and it's hard to line up, but, but endeavoring to line up the broad goals with the, the action items with what that actually you know, translates out into the work for this year and next year. So I really appreciate that. I appreciate the process of us, you know, the dialogue that was available for the public to attend um, and, and also review this so some people had issues that could come out. The one thing that I just have a question on, and this is as much for, you know, I'm not on the Environmental Commission, but I'm um, thinking about the priority of what we want to, what the, was the Environmental Real Commission really more interested in doing zero waste events you know, in 2024 then moving forward on a recycling ordinance? Because as somebody who's been in Oxford for 20 years now and the students have been saying to me like, why can't I have a recycling in my apartment complex? Like, I've grown impatient over the issues that we seem unable to move the needle on. And so I'm just, you know, I, we can wait till 2025, but when I think of like, which is more impactful, you know, having zero waste events uptown, I want, I'm looking forward to that, but like, do we not want to move forward with the recycling ordinance to finally get students in apartment complexes the opportunity to recycle? Jessica, could you kind of summarize the where the 
well, environmental I, commission. I didn't attend the environmental commission meeting, but I know that there was discussion. And so when I spoke with Rena Murphy, our staff, and I said, you know, here's the whole list. You know, do you have any impact or feedback? She brought forward this feedback. You know, she said we studied. Uh, multifamily and commercial recycling in depth in 23 um, and we found that it's going to be really hard to accomplish and so um, they then recommended zero waste in 24 because they felt like they could accomplish it and then we keep nudging along the multifamily and commercial in 25 um, acknowledging that some parts of it are going to be really really hard to do um, based on property ownership and you know things like that so um, that that is my report from my staff member and that's <laughs> all I really know Okay. Thank I feel you. like that's accurate because, I mean, it's not, I look at it as not picking one over the other, but picking, picking the lowest hanging fruit. And so a zero waste event is something that we can do hopefully rapidly and not draw it out the whole year um, while still working on recycling. Yeah. Okay. Any and I immediately, questions? sorry, I was just going to say, I immediately went to the PSP team's report, which if you haven't seen, I can send you. Okay, okay, that's fine. I mean, I, just by the set of the room, I was going to make make a motion. See, it sounds like it would fail based on. I mean, I had language about us doing this, and I hope in my twenty one years in Oxford and six years or seven years on council, we can finally get relief for its students in apartment buildings. I know it's going to be hard, and if it were easy, we would have done it any time in the previous twenty one years. Uh, but. Um, I've okay. been that student since my first year on campus, like 10 years ago. So I know there's 12. hesitation, <laughs> but damn, I hope we do it sometime. But everything else looks great. I really appreciate the changes that were made um, by staff in response to our suggestions. Any other questions or comments? Are you ready to vote? All those in favor of the resolution indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Resolution is adopted, and you can read the second one. A resolution accepting the recommendation of the Environmental Commission and authorizing the city manager to submit public comment to the Butler County Recycling and Solid Waste District Solid Waste Management Plan update. Okay. Is there a motion to adopt this resolution? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Jessica. Good evening. Um, I bring this forward in as a representative of Rena Murphy. Um, she um, is a, has been attending the Butler County Recycling and Solid Waste District meetings, and they have released a new solid waste plan update and have requested public comment. Um, she then shared this with the Environmental Commission, and they did have um, public comment. And Mr. Elliott recommended that we share this with Council to make sure that you approve of these comments before we then submit the public comments to the Butler County Solid Waste District. Um, their comments are um, to implement the proposed generation fee inc increase earlier than 2031 and or consider a higher increase in fees to support further progress toward the EPA's goal diversion rate of 25%. And their other comment is to um, develop incentives for waste reduction and recycling such as pay-as-you-go, pay-as-you-throw pricing models for landfill materials. Those are their true, excuse me, two primary comments. Um, and I answer what I can based on, uh, based on this feedback. So, thanks. Um, so are these comments? They would be submitted as written comments to the Butler County Soil and Water District for review and their plan creation. <clears throat> would those comments represent the city's position? Because if so, we have to have a different conversation, especially when it comes to pay as you throw. That's a pretty big issue. Well, that's why I suggested we bring it to city council because, you know, council is the policy-making body for the city. And yes, you should probably uh, discuss it and, and amend it if you are so inclined. Okay, thank you. All right, is there anyone from the public who would like to address this resolution, please? No, please come on up. Everybody's got to come up. <laughs> Just as the property manager, in, I'm Christina Hool, and um, I'm a property manager in town. And we see just over 174 doors. We're small, but I spoke with somebody from students getting their masters about the recycling and waste. It's a huge problem. We're furnishing our units, so we don't have the the end of year trash that you see in a lot of places, as many places as possible. When we have owner support. And we did have recycling at 9 West High Street, but they're open air. 
and then Rumkey won't touch them. They won't get out of their trucks and take out a bag of garbage if it's in the recycling. So it poses a problem. So we staff our, um, our trash every single morning. We have a gentleman, he's 62, he's lovely. He goes around and makes sure that it's clean and tidy and picks up when need be. And um, I think it's that kind of support and that kind of effort. I don't think we need to wait until 2025. I think that we can be proactive independently. It doesn't need to be some big sweeping government, you know. But I think incentivizing um, the cost of a recycling waste dumpster versus just the regular open air is substantial for property owners that are already being heavily taxed because, you know, we had to readjust all of that so everyone can eat off their profits. So those are getting smaller and smaller each year. And as we try to be creative in creating a profit margin, we do consider trash as a big problem. So students are not always thoughtful when they're throwing items away at the end of the day. So, you know, it does take staff on our part to make sure that it's where it needs to be. And I think that needs to be like the understood you in the sentence. It's not just going to naturally happen. We have to engage and support them in everything they do. They're learning life and we're here for it. So I just think it's important to stay engaged and talk about cost um, and try to get those costs parallel or similar to, I don't see why it would cost more to dump a recycling bin versus a regular bin, but it is substantial. So if you could maybe address those issues, then we can be a little more proactive and act quicker. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to address this resolution? Okay, counselors. I'm, I guess I don't, I am not well enough informed, but remain skeptical about pay as you throw pricing models for, in, for uh, residential um, waste. Uh, I, I just think there's a, a complexity there. I realize that it would be less, it would be a, a boon to me because I put garbage out about once every three weeks. I put recycling out a lot more often. On the other hand, I, I just, it sounds like a recording nightmare. I don't know how you accurately measure all that and I don't know how you do that. So that's my commentary on the whereas that has pay as you throw, that's the only one I have a question about. It, EPA is in support of pay as you throw. Um, they talk about it being a more sustainable option, more economic sustainable, and also more equitable because people like you should not be paying the same as someone who dumps stuff all the time. Um, is it possible that we incentivize people to just hoard garbage. I mean, there are a lot of places you drive by where there's a lot of junk just mm. piled, not in Oxford, but in other places, and they don't want to haul it, and they don't want to pay for it to be hauled to the dumps, to the garbage dump, to Rumpke. Um, so I worry about unintentional consequences of people hoarding garbage instead of paying for it and not putting it out. Even though it would benefit me personally, I've recognized that. I'm worried about the logistics of being able to do that and the unintentional motivations that it may lead to. So, so just to understand, what's you all the, help me with the, that. But the, the import of this is we're submitting some comments on behalf of the city of Oxford as recommended by the Environmental Commission that will inform the plan so I mean we're not talking I mean like between making a comment and any of these policy changes being implemented is a lot of yeah so I mean I guess the significance one way or the other of offering comment I mean these seem to be encouraging a plan is there much harm in <laughs> well what it does is it tells them that the city's position is that we should do this I would be happy to say uh, collaboration with waste haulers develop incentives for waste reduction and recycling and leave out the specifics and let them come up with what those might be, what those incentives might be. I just don't know that we have done enough research to be able to say that that's a good option for Oxford and so should we be telling them 
hey, this is Oxford's position on this. We should do pay as you throw. Can, oh, sorry, Doug, you go. Well, I mean, I, I, Bill and I spoke about this when we went over the agenda Friday, and I really gave it more thought. I don't think this is going to be an issue because it's already in their plan to look into pay as you throw. It'll be up to each community to decide what they want to do. You know, right. if there's some program that we could implement a pay as you throw program, let's say in a certain area, then maybe we do that. But you know, if you've read the report, they talk about recycling and you've got a lot of communities that don't provide recycling like we do. And so right. you have to subscribe. Here, you don't get a choice. You're gonna get charged for it whether you use it or not at least as far as the residents go. So I really think it'll be okay to leave that in. I mean, we, we've had lots of discussions and, and uh, years ago I was city manager in New England and we were one of the first to implement a pay as you throw program, but we were a different community. We were 12,000, we didn't have a big college campus with a lot of rental units. We did not provide that service, solid waste or recycling to the commercial apartments, businesses, they were on their own. We just focused on the residents. And so we had a pay as you throw program. You paid at that time, I think $2.10 for a 30 gallon bag and half that for a 15 gallon bag. If it wasn't in the bag, they didn't pick it up. And so the program worked and we really, uh, you know, increased our recycling. I think we recycle at 60% of our waste then. Uh, but once again, it was only focused on residents and not the commercial businesses. And so, uh, you know, it's a different community. We have our own unique challenges here. And the other thing is that we paid on a per ton basis for our solid waste collection for the residents. Here we pay based on how many stops, not how much they pick up, but based on the stops. So if they pick up one ton, we're gonna pay the same amount as if they pick up 30 tons it's built into their rate. So, you know, we have a lot of issues to talk about. You know, I, I was really happy to hear the young lady talk about her apartment complex because that's what it takes is somebody to go out because students don't think a lot and, you know, they are in a hurry so they put trash in the recycling and then Rumpke's not gonna go through it and pick it up or pick it out. And so, you know, we have more and more examples of that and we should probably collect more of those so I think little by little it's getting better but you know it's something I think we all uh, strive for and as Bill mentioned I mean I think Beth and I we put out you know a little kitchen garbage bag of trash but our recycling bin is full all the time and uh, but uh, so I think it's okay to leave this in because it'll still be up to us to decide how we're going to do it but if they can come up with an innovative program or maybe help us structure uh, a, uh, an example program in, in uh, let's say a residential area just to see how it would work within our contract, you know, maybe that's something that we can talk about later. But uh, I did want council to at least see what the Environmental Commission was recommending because I feel strongly that the council is our policy making body, uh, you know, not the Environmental Commission. Thank you. Although we do defer to the commission, I mean, I'm just, I, if, if we defer to the commission in the recommendation on what council and staff priorities should be on that count, then we, I'm going to defer to their expertise on this. I'm not sure we should have done that in the first case, you know, but uh, in this one, if they put more thought into it, and it seems like the risks are minimal. We have looked at the pay is, you know, the by weight, we've looked at that in the past and we're unlikely to go there. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on this resolution? I just want to commend you. I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, but the property owner, property manager, thank you so much for moving to furnished apartments. I think you said little by little you're adding more. It's very I mean, smart. It's amazing. I mean, because that's what it's going to take because the truth is it doesn't matter how much recycling we do. We can't recycle the mattresses. We can't recycle all the desks. So what you're doing is saving way more tonnage out of the landfill than any of us can do singularly. Which apartments do you manage? I elevate my own property. Okay, thank you. I talked to everybody else. Yeah, good job. <laughs> Michael, did you wanna make a comment? Just a couple comments. One good thing about being a dinosaur is you remember history. <laughs> and uh, we've been there, we've done volume-based fees in the past and the 
late 90s, and uh, it, it caused a lot of problems. It sounds great. It's a great ideal. Uh, maybe not so much for a college town. Uh, we don't necessarily have the space and the mile square for that. We definitely don't have the enforcement. And uh, our fees were volume-based, so you might have one can or two cans. And uh, more times than I could count, uh, people would get you know, 800 pounds into one little can, and Rumpke couldn't even lift the things. <laughs> uh, it just caused uh, so much problems for staff and, and for residents, and there was litter everywhere and illegal dumping. That's what I recall. So. Uh, uh, I recall coming back to council with a, uh, I believe it was a 10 can limit after having volume based fees and with a lower rate. And uh, there was such a, a sigh of relief from the residents that that burden was lifted from them. So it's, it's a great ideal, but uh, it's really tough in a college town to do that. And also, I wanted to mention our uh, option year is ending this year with Rumpke, so we will be. Uh, specifying a new contract, so we will have to get input from city manager and council before we release that. Uh, but we will do that this year. And also, Rumpke has already cautioned us that uh, with their bid, uh, we will have at least double digit increases in our rates. So uh, we need to be cautious as to what we specify because uh, last time we bid this contract was five years ago. It was before COVID, it was, uh, fuel was, well, I shouldn't say fuel was cheaper, but uh, uh, there's more uncertainty about fuel and they're very concerned about how they bid in the future with unknown costs. And labor costs more, trucking costs more, fees keep going up. So we need to be cautious with what we specify so that we can still afford uh, the service that we need. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say, in defense of many students, I know a lot of students who are way more conscientious about recycling and um, knowing what goes where than, than many people who aren't. So we appreciate the students who are doing that and the residents who are doing that. Absolutely. And of course, um, property managers. Thank you. Additional questions or comments? OK, all those in favor of the resolution indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? It's adopted, and we'll move to the third. A resolution accepting the bid and authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract with W.G. Stang, LLC, for the replacement of a culvert on Kerr Road at a cost of $101,140 plus a 10% contingency in the amount of $10,114 for a total cost not to exceed $111,254. Is there a motion to adopt? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Mike? We have a culvert that's in poor condition on Kerr Road just south of Chestnut Street. And we have budgeted from the fiscal year 23 budget $250,000 set aside for the project. Uh, I'd like to thank our engineering group. Uh, they were successful in winning a, a public works commission grant for this project. So the Public Works Commission will spend 59% uh, of the project costs and will cover 41% of the costs locally. Uh, we do have a payment from uh, Butler County already in hand from uh, motor vehicle license plate fees. Uh, so that will pay for our local share. So uh, really we have no local money uh, into this project. So that's a good way to fund this. Good thing. Uh, we'll be replacing the uh, conduit under the roadway. We'll also take the opportunity while the street's closed to uh, regrade the ditches and slopes to the, through the creek. Uh, we'll cut back vegetation uh, throughout the right-of-way. Uh, we'll also replace some guardrail and add some riprap in the project. Uh, we went out for bid. We had three responses. Uh, WG Sang was the lowest. We got very good pricing, much lower than what our estimate was. So we're very pleased with that. We've worked with Stang in the past with excellent results and recommend you approve this contract. Quick question, will it require closing Kerr Road? Yes, we will need to close the road. Completely. So it should only be for a couple weeks. Uh, we plan to do it during the summer, so hopefully we'll have minimal impact to transportation to and from school. Did you say early summer? Summer. <laughs> 
We'll strive for early summer. Thank you, sir. It's always appreciated. Okay. All right. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address this resolution before council? Okay. Councilors, any questions or comments? Okay. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Resolution is adopted. Thank you, Mike. Okay, we have ordinances. We have no first readings, but we do have one second reading. An ordinance to approve current replacement pages to the Oxford codified ordinances. Okay, is there a motion to adopt this, this ordinance? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Anything new? Nothing new. I recommend adoption. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address this ordinance? It was discussed in detail last time. Okay, any comments or concerns by council? Please call the roll. Ms. French? Yes. Mr. Prethurge? Yes. Ms. Ragu? Yes. Mr. Bracken? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Ms. Franklin? Yes. Mayor Snavely? Yes. Okay, the ordinance is adopted and we'll move to our discussion items. And the first one, um, council retreat next steps and 2025 action items. Welcome back. Hello again. I restarted my computer. Let's see if it works. Ta-da. Well, let's see if it stays. Okay. <laughs> we also as part of our retreat, you know, once we kind of get through 24 and, you know, kind of refining those, we then talk to council and say, what do you want us to research for the budget season? And um, that feels very far away, but in reality, we start our budget season in May. And so council gave us um, a lot of ideas. We did it kind of different this year where we didn't have a ton of time at the retreat, but people submitted ideas on a, an online PowerPoint. And then we were able to share that with the group and then people then added on new ideas and comments. Um, and so I wanted to come back to council and see how you wanted to proceed. One idea would be we have another retreat, another work session where we refine and kind of narrow the scope on some of these first step, you direct us staff on what you want us to focus on. Another idea I have is to kick, there are a lot under um, housing and sustainability especially, so we could kick it back to our boards and commissions and say, you, boards and commissions, here's a whole list, please research and provide a recommendation back to council, the refinement that you think is recommended. And then those where maybe a border commission didn't quite fit, you know, I assigned a staff member. Um, and I'm really just, so then the next step would be one of our new ideas this year that we have not done in the past is that we would have a, another council retreat um, before the budget um, comes out. And so likely that would be in May um, where we would talk about both the capital budget and the operating budget to kind of that would just be another opportunity for council to give input as we're developing that budget cycle um, for that next year. So with that in mind, I wanted to ask you, what would what would you like to do? I'm really open. Counselors. I think that getting a lot done in two hours was a really tall order. So I mean, I don't think my schedule is like the worst it could ever possibly be in May, so I'd say that sounds lovely. May sound good to other people. Some of my understanding said that would be a follow up and tied to the budget process, or like, okay. It, it, either option would we have, we would have a meeting in May. So we either have another council work session where you then give us refinement on this list of ideas for 25. And then we would meet again in May to make sure we got it right and you know that kind of stuff. Or we send these back to boards and commissions and staff and then they then bring those recommendations forward in May where you guys have a retreat and can say, yep, you got it right or mm, let's change it. Does it make sense to give our boards and commissions an opportunity to weigh in on these? I like the idea, but to me, I would be thinking more like, I would be thinking we'd be setting broad goals for, tw I'm not sure boards and commissions are thinking a year out, to be honest. Like, I mean, I would think like, this is our goal for 24, meet early, and this is what we're gonna do in 24. I welcome their input and engagement as far as, you know, how, how what kind of conversations we, it'd be a completely new kind of conversations that we've never had before about thinking about a year ahead out with, with budget implications. Um, 
But I, I feel like, I mean, I believe in our boards and commissions, and I believe they can add a lot of value. Um, so I'm trying to imagine how those conversations would go. Um, I mean, I think we should be engaging them on all of these things, the 23, the 24, and the 25. Like, this is what we've said you could do, you know, should the agenda should be. And I mean, I think just as we're setting our agenda for 24 and 25, I think all boards should be saying, what are we going to do this year? And, and it should be in relation to some of this. So I mean, I think we should be having conversations with our boards and commissions in March and April one way or the other. It's just whether the 25 budget items are part of the scope of that conversation. I, mean, I see the advantage of sharing the workload, too, of having the boards and committees weighing in and doing early research. And then I would agree with what Alex said. My schedule is also not the worst in May. So we, I would be fine with that. It's generally a good time. Yeah. The so the question is whether we go to the boards. Right. Or, or. I think looking at this list, right, like keeping in mind we have April, March and April, so likely only two meetings. And some of these totally attainable. Like CIC is not too bad. Um, but like HAC and Environmental Commission have a hefty list in addition to what's already on their agendas. So just trying to be mindful of it's only two meetings and so I think we definitely keep them involved, my thought process here. Maybe we just change that order of operation so we do the kind of consolidation of this list based on the sense of council. We then do a second retreat and then once we have a more concrete list, we then pass it back to boards and commissions to work on throughout the year. So that way we're getting their involvement, but we're not, what I don't want to do is have them spend two full months of meetings or feel pressure to add a meeting or something like that. And then we say, oh, actually, we really don't like that idea that you spent all of that time working on. So that's just, Well, they I'm can flexible. help inform us whether we do like it or not. Sure. And there are other things in between. We could have our first meeting, come up with ideas, send it back to them to see if they have anything to add or comments, and that would inform us on the final meeting in May. Jessica, what did you present to us? You presented to us the possibility of having staff work on consolidating. Yeah, I'm sorry I was, if I wasn't clear. So one idea would be to have another council retreat slash work session. We could do it as a work session before a council meeting or we could have a special meeting, you know, on an off week or something. And then we have the good old stickering where you, you as council then narrows your scope and says, we really want you to research these things to bring forward for the budget. So that's idea number one. Idea number two is we skip that. And we say, dear boards and commissions and staff, the only, only ones that staff would really work on would be the ones that don't have like a really clear board or commission tie. And we would say to them, please like narrow the scope based on your input and what do you want council to bring forward to As the budget? As a priority. Mm -hmm. Is that more clear? So it shouldn't take two meetings to even for the Environmental Commission to talk okay. about these sure. things and say, yeah, this is something we should prioritize. No, this is not as important. But I, I don't see that. I mean, I think ultimately the prioritization has to be us. Well, and you know? ultimately it is us. And so I, I mean, that's I, what May's for. And, and one of the things I think that just, just to, to add on to this conversation is that we frame the boards and commissions often as kind of just purely advisory. And, and, you know, with the limiting factor being the staff time. But I also know the boards and commission, like our boards and commissioners are often working really hard and can contribute value to some of these things. So I think asking the question, like, we want to do this goal, how do we divide up the labors to do it? Because not, not absolutely everything is a dollar thing that we need to pay a consultant for. Sometimes it's just labor time. So, I mean, I would ask, again, the boards and commissions, how can you help us, how can we work together to advance the goals? Part help us prioritize. Yeah. yeah. So number two is sounds like option oh. two is what I'm kind of hearing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And All we right. still meet in May, no matter. And we still meet in May, yeah. and you guys get and to we'll be the final. We're idea. the ones who arbitrate. Yeah, the, yeah. Okay. you're the ones who are going to say, "Yeah, you got it right." Or but another retreat, maybe not. Okay. Yeah. So we yeah. will meet in May with council at a work session before staff put input into the budget, right? So in the past, staff would present a budget and say, here's our thoughts, and you would respond. We're gonna flip that a little bit this year and have you and say, okay, here's what we're thinking, did we get it right? And then we begin to start to build the budget with your input first. 
And so that that's a, a slight tweak um, that we're going to be implementing this year, and we'll see how it goes. It's a new it's a new idea. Can so you get we, these yeah. to the boards and commissions yeah. pretty quickly? Like tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. And so if, for example, we like we'd like to see a tweak here. It's mostly going to be like those conversations with the boards and commissions that will help us arrive at I think so. the tweak of the language too. That's what May's for. Okay. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and there's constant right. refinement, right? Because then we go into the budget and et cetera and so on. So it's just, yep, we're good. All right, you want to shift to public Wi-Fi? Yes. Okay, public Wi-Fi. I'm going to do a little, during COVID, we had CARES Act funds, and we invested $327,000 into a public Wi-Fi program. That was largely infrastructure, and then the ongoing annual cost was $31,200 per year for three years. That contract expires. When we went to do the renewal, we were a bit shocked to see that the cost went up to $48,000 a year, which is $16,800 more per year than what we budgeted. And when we did a little bit of research, we learned that that cost increase is hardware maintenance. Um, because when we had first paid for that install, we prepaid for three years of hardware, security, and um, software maintenance. And so we were like, oh, okay. So we prepaid up front, and now we have to kind of add it into our annual operations if we're going to keep it. So we did a little bit of research on how is the public Wi-Fi being used. And the public Wi-Fi is uptown, the Tri-Center, the community park, and then Parkview Arms. And then there's a little bit of access at what we call the tower, which I'll show you in a minute. And what we can do is we can get counts for 90 days and we can get a count on devices. So not users, but literally devices, which means I stand here and I have three devices, my watch, my phone, and my computer. So to each of you, you know, if you have a watch, a phone, a computer, you just, that's the number of devices on the network. So in the past 90 days, Uptown and the Tri-Center, I don't know why they combine these, but they do on the report, had 10.2 average devices. This is daily. The Community Park had 5.9 devices. The Tower, which is actually staff only, has four devices. And Parkview Arms had 115 devices. We don't really have a way to know the number of individuals. We can only count these number of devices that connect. So our options are, to keep it the same, we need to find $16,800 annually for three years somewhere. It, it might mean cutting something else in our budget this year. Doug and I spoke and we don't really know where else it would come from. So that's something for us to think about. We then talked about, well, maybe we should narrow it down to Parkview Roms only. And so we did a little bit of research and we said, you know, our current provider is PowerNet. And we said, hey, PowerNet, could you do Parkview Arms only? And they said, no, we can't. And so, and I'll explain why, if you show you why. Let's see if this works. Is it going to work? Okay. Maybe. Yeah, okay. The way the All City Wi Fi works right now, and I am not a technical person, but I'm going to do my best to explain this um, in regular human. Uh, terms is we have a giant tower over here behind the city garage and they have a signal that goes from that tower out to these other receivers around town and these other receivers are the community park um, the tri park view arms and then uptown and then at each of those locations there are other like little receivers that then kind of amplify that service out to that area so that's how it works so the way this system is set up with PowerNet is it doesn't matter if you beam to one location or four, the cost is the same. Like they don't give us any discount for just beaming out to one other place because the infrastructure is already there at all the places. And I'm like, okay. So then we called another provider and we said, so hey, if we wanted to do Parkview Farms only, what would it be? And what they would do is they would get rid of the big tower signal this is hard to see, but they would, this is Parkview Arms, this is the apartment complex. They would run like a hard wire internet into number one here, so Spectrum or Alta Fiber, you know, one of those, um, a cable. And then they would use the existing Wi-Fi in infrastructure that we already have there to then amplify through the building. So very similar to what they're getting now, 
um, except it wouldn't be being amplified across town. Um, and so perhaps a little bit better performing because right now it's a little like if it rains a lot or it's foggy, that signal you can imagine can kind of get interrupted. Um, that would be $18,000 a year plus an unknown amount of our licensing, hardware, and security fees, which are being like we're in negotiations right now, but it could be anywhere between $2,000 and $12,000, so between $20,000 and $30,000 to do just park fee warms. I'll know more on Thursday. Um, and then a third thing I researched was just doing like a group contract for the apartment complex and see if we could just pay for every unit's internet and that far exceeded what we're paying for public Wi-Fi. So I was like, well, I don't like that idea. And so then my last two ideas would be one would be like, you know what, Wi-Fi, it just public Wi-Fi didn't work out. We cut the program and we instead give our public Wi-Fi dollars to like the Family Resource Center to then give um, assistance out to families who apply for internet assistance and the amount that we have budgeted in this year's budget and we see how that works or or we cut the program completely so I the one thing that like hurts my heart a little bit would be all the infrastructure that we did that installed um, we could try to sell it but it's three years old and so I, I don't know how much we would actually get back for that um, and so I wanted to share all of these challenges with you and, and seek your feedback um, on what direction you'd like us to explore. How many people live in PVA, roughly? Or how many units? How many? There are 86 units. So that's actually, so may, do we have a good feel? Do most people, do they like the program or a PVA? We don't know. We don't know. That's actually pretty good, I guess, right? Like 100. I mean, like be people. one device per apartment, yeah. or, or it could be one apartment with a lot of devices. There's no really way to know. Like my, we were counting in my house alone. I'm not. I mean, we're a very tech-heavy family, but like my little family, my family of five, we have like 70 devices in our house. <laughs> but we have, we all have a watch. We all have a phone. We all have a Chromebook. You know, the kids' Chromebooks and stuff. Um, our robot vacuum is a device. So. It could either be a lot of a few apartments with a lot of devices, or it could be like one de device per apartment. I don't know. So the sunken cost of the infrastructure is about two hundred thousand dollars, right? More than that. I, I believe our. I can't remember, but I, I believe it was closer to three hundred thousand for the infrastructure build out okay. years ago. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that included the three years of the service, but no. It did include, so I, I don't have the exact numbers to share with you, I'm sorry. But yes, between $200,000 and $300,000 in infrastructure. Uh, my personal preference would be to hardwire PVA. I think it gets enough use, you could really use it. It takes advantage of some infrastructure we already have. That's where I'm at. Makes sense to me. So one thing I would say is we have to put into context that, that through 90 days Three of those four locations are outdoors, <laughs> or two of them, and it was November, December, and January. So, you know, I think we have to put that data in context. If I, you know, I, I, I think that the the value and clearly the usage of PVA, as long as we can deal with the equity issues of why we're doing this one complex and not somewhere else, but I really would hate to see the uptown park of the of the locations that I think. I mean, I haven't seen the data for when it's not, you know. November, December, January. Um, but the I, usage is probably higher yeah. during the music festival. Yeah, and I can see a lot of value for the farmer's market and all these sorts of things, activities that we're having that I think having public Wi-Fi, the wine event, um, to the degree that we, I know that it may not be cost savings to, to do that. Um, I, I would hate to see that go away. I think if the parks didn't have it, you know, I just think the usage of the parks is not so high. Coming back to uptown, once upon a time, Jessica, when you were with the Convention Visitors Bureau, we were talking about this and there was always the assumption there would be ongoing costs and that was the, the hurdle. But th there was a talk at the time, well, what if we had a landing page that had advertising? You know, before we scrap the idea, is it not possible that there can be partnership with uptown businesses, you know, with, with the um, Enjoy Oxford or, you know, the Chamber of Commerce, we, don't have a business improvement district uptown. I mean, I can ask district, if they'd be willing to go out and solicit. Um, but I think before we before we decide to yank the infrastructure, we always knew we were going to have to pay ongoing costs, and there are benefits to 
mm -hmm. partner businesses of town. And so I think we should try that route before we decide it's infeasible. Can I ask how many of us in the room have used the public Wi-Fi? Because I feel like when I tried, it was kind of crappy. Yeah. Does everyone feel the same? Yeah. It's gotten better. I could never do it for like years because the, the, the entry page was just so bad. It was impossible. I couldn't log on. I, Recently, it's become, I've used it once now that it's usable, I've used it. I haven't used it recently, but used it once. when I tried, I, I remember doing it simply because I wanted as a city councilor to say like, I use this, this it, it wasn't great, um, but I haven't tried it in the last, I don't know, year. That's been my experience too. I should, we should probably go out and try it again because we did, we took off that landing page, which is where the advertising would be, and that's why it's now working. <laughs> um, but I haven't really tried it, you know, myself either. But I, I had similar experience. I was just really frustrated, and I'll be honest, I was like, ah, you know, I, it felt like um, it was a rushed public project with CARES Act, and if we could go back in time, I would do things a lot differently. But you know, it was a rushed time, and it was during COVID, and we did what we could with what we had. Yeah, I was going to say, I think the decision was well, in, there was a need, right? Mm -hmm. More than any other time we've ever had. Right. <laughs> and plus, we did With do some schools. good for those who are most in need in this situation. Um, I wouldn't mind something uptown that served people, but also a lot of that is localized because there's Wi Fi in individual businesses. Um, I, I wouldn't be opposed to exploring some other method because this seems particularly expensive and covers areas that probably don't need it as much. Yeah. It, it, if we do go the route of hardwiring any apartment building, I would like that to come with certain exchanges, like better management, so or something, you know, something that like we're giving you this amenity which your residents so desperately need. What kind of, what else can you do, you know, so that if this is happening, I'm not saying that that is the route I'd like to go. I like the. FRC route, but also not opposed to that. But I would like there to be some conversation about what that, I mean, that what a huge benefit for their residents. The, I don't want to speak for the management, but they, they were like, I mean, do it if you want, but yeah. it wasn't. <laughs> Which is kind of bonkers that yeah, you're saying we so have this can. amazing access that your, yeah, your residents a, need, yeah. and we're sort of indifferent, and it might interrupt us a little bit. Like, or at least, like, if we get somewhere, like, that they're not going to increase rent now that they have this amenity that we're paying for, right? Like, I would hate to see that happen. And then people who could afford to live there now can't afford to live there. But I know we, I'd like, right, we probably could can't happen. do anything about that. Yeah. Well, there are some controls on that because yeah. of um, sure. their subsidies. Yeah. But also, we're already providing the service to some extent. Yeah, hopefully, it's point. better yeah. if we hardwire it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, any cost changes would be built in already. And I don't mind subsidizing what internet access for lower income people. I don't like the idea of subsidizing it for the property owners, you know, and that's the difficult thing with the, this situation of yeah, apartment specific improvements. And there's not a way to really separate them. I, I feel I would be really curious what FRC and in communication with PBA, what their thoughts are, you know, because if they're like, Oh, we have free internet? I don't know. If that's the response, then okay, there's our answer. So, um. I would worry just a long history of government services and other things says you need to make options the default and that you don't have to like go to FRC and ask for subsidies or access, right? It's just a lot of people have, pardon the term, but Obama phones, right? So. I think that there is certain, I believe the Obama phones do not have a limit on the Wi-Fi. Am I right about that? Does anybody know? There are resources for internet for low-income families, um, whether it's phone assistance or even internet programs. I don't know a lot about them, but I know they exist when we were doing our research for the broadband program. So I mean, it, it's getting late, so. Chief so. wanted to make a comment. You know, when this uh, project was first being talked about, I attended a PVA resident council meeting um, where Amy Mashechko and and that was being discussed. And actually, there was there were people who were against it because they thought it would draw people in. But that that source, I would suggest that source of going through Amy to get some feedback from the PVA residents of of are they, are you using this 
or is it just devices that are turned on that's not you know that you're not not getting but I just I just know there was a lot of discussion at that meeting about it um, and uh, and it was both sides so I, I just think we if we're gonna get some feedback yeah. from them rather than go to the FRC like let's go directly to that resident council and, and get some feedback and also there was there was conversations with management too and I agree with some of the comments made like not like not there there you know there there are things we would like to see from them uh, so I don't know why we keep providing these items to that property management company um, okay. and, and not seeing the same level of property management out of other places that we do out of other places but the PBA resident council and the coalition for healthy community I think would be a good place to get some feedback I think uh, that's for an that. excellent suggestion yeah. And another thing, just while I'm on the topic, sure. uh, you know, we, we had one time go to put cameras up in the uptown parks. Um, we were trying to connect to that Wi-Fi, and it, we discovered it had been shut off for a while. So when you have Wi-Fi that had been shut off for a long time and nobody's called the city to complain, yeah. that, that was indicative to us that this is not a great project. So that's, I that's all that's I'll say. the bottom line. Well, and my daughter people, said to me, like, she's like, Dad, if you can do anything at council, could you just get that Wi-Fi uptown to work? I mean, I think they want to use it. They just, it's been not easy to use, which is disappointing. I think a lot yeah, not of ever. modern phones will operate basic stuff without Wi-Fi. Yeah, it's not just it's do the, the major, laptops that... Yeah, laptop downloads. But how, I mean, I just haven't seen many instances. I did see once during the winter when it was cold, somebody was in one of the igloos with their laptop yeah. open, so. Yeah, I love it. I mean, I'm, I'm in between meetings. I can sit down and work from the uptown parks, but I don't need to pay for coffee to go and use Wi-Fi now that it's been working. More research. Um, it does, our agreement ends in February. So I, I do believe we've convinced them to give us like a month to month option um, to just buy us a little bit of time, and so we may, just so you know, we will probably pursue that, pay for another month, and right. then come back to you with perhaps a recommendation based on your yeah, input what and, what we, learned, and what we learned from the Residence Council. Yeah. And, um, and then we'll... And your partners uptown. I, and mean, I, I think yep, it's I worth have, an ask. So I have partners uptown, um, Residence Council is a good idea, and to see if we can get um, maybe even just a more updated user count. I'll even see if they have past data, like can, I don't think they do, because I believe I asked. Um, but I'll see if I can get more recent data. So. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. That leads us to announcements and communications. And I'll start with the city manager. Thank you. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention is that you will get a chance to vote on the uh, final Butler County solid waste plan uh, because uh, they mentioned in the handout that uh, it needs to be approved by 60% of Butler County political subdivisions, including Hamilton, the largest city. Uh, and they've had a 95 to 99% uh, approval rate. So we will get to see what, uh, what they are recommending in the solid waste management plan, or you'll get to vote on, excuse me. Uh, Police Community Relations and Review Board, we had a meeting uh, last week, February 15th. Uh, I attended, our law director, police chief, and assistant city manager attended as well. And the agenda included an update on the November 18th, 2023 use of force incident and a discussion of the use of force policy. It was a well attended meeting uh, with several attendees commenting on the incident and asking questions. Uh, so uh, we were pleased with that meeting and the number of folks that attended. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to share with you we had a Municipal Records Commission meeting, and uh, at that meeting, we approved several uh, one-time disposal uh, records, uh, and then we also approved seven certificates of records disposal. We've had a lot of uh, information uh, since we've changed our uh, <coughs> digital software, and so a lot of uh, work uh, put on by uh, Heather, and Jessica and our department heads and, and their staff. So we meet regularly with our records commission. And that's all I have this evening. Okay, thank you. Michael? Yeah. Heidi? Yeah. Chief Dethridge? Casey? Nothing tonight. Hey, I'm glad you're here, though. 
Chief? Okay. Sam? Jessica? You would think I have nothing else, but. <laughs> I counted on you. I just want the public to know that Sylvester Stallone will be filming a movie in Oxford starting next week, possibly even this Saturday. Um, <laughs> And, but so if you see them around town, they will be filming uptown. They will have um, our fire and EMS team there because they might have a small explosion. Um, and they'll be filming around town in various spots on the 27th. Sylvester 20 Stallone, they might have an explosion? Maybe. <laughs> uh, on the 27th, 28th, the 1st and 2nd. So we've been working daily with the production company on timing and where and parking and all that kind of stuff. But I just wanted everyone to know and we'll put that out in an email to the public here soon as well. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Heather? Nothing, thank you. Okay, Ben? Nothing tonight, thank you. Mike? Just a reminder that uh, next Monday at 5 o'clock, the Oxford Area Solutions for Housing Group, OSH, meets at 5 o'clock in the Presbyterian Church Seminary Building. Thank you. Nothing for me. We, this past Saturday, during the big storm, um, we had our uh, trap neuter release program again and so eight Ohio State vet students drove down in the storm and made it. Uh, we were supposed to do 26 cats but one of the trappers car broke down. So we only had 14 but we spayed and neutered 14 cats and we had three pre-vet Miami students and three of us doctors and it was just really really wonderful. So we're going into cat breeding season and um, the other thing I learned that I was reading the county commissioner handbook for a separate reason um, about <laughs> their <laughs> about their roles and the example they gave was really interesting between city and county politics and they said the county right it is a branch of the state so if the state does not have an ordinance or a law about it the county cannot act on it and they gave the example about feral cats and they said this is not because the state says nothing about feral cats the county has no power over feral cats so I was like, that is very interesting. So that means that actually falls on us um, of when we think about how do we want to handle cats? Do we want to handle cats the same way we want to handle dogs? You know, it's, it's, this is a pretty big problem and the county is not going to step in because they legally cannot. So food for thought. Thank you, Chantel. Uh, I want to say that we had a very successful um, event on second Friday earlier this month. It was the second annual municipal art exhibit unveiling, grand opening. And I want to thank all of the artists who submitted uh, work. Uh, congratulations again to those who were selected. But a special thank you to Jessica, Heather, Ashley, Eli, and Mr. Dreisbach, who him and his staff helped to um, mount all of the art. We really appreciate your willingness to do that. Um, so when you go to the municipal building, please enjoy the art that's there. And uh, look forward to more public, public art coming in 2024 and 2025. Hopefully a mural somewhere, some good stuff happening in Oxford. So thanks, everybody. Awesome. Jason. Nothing for me today. Hey. So, so first, I want to... Um, thank um, Mr. Chaffin for bringing forward, uh, you know, some of us when we sit up here, we, we, we don't all see what it's like to sit down there and I think that those ways in which we can improve so people don't feel like it's a catch-22 situation we're like, how can I ask a question and get a response? Um, I think we sometimes we say, hey, you know, this is not a time for discussion, but how does one get an answer to one's question? So I think that like you know, I, I don't know how we want to handle it. I think that what uh, he has proposed seems like a reasonable thing. Um, and whether, you know, we want to just have a discussion item first on a meeting about, how, you know, are we in support of this, changes to this, or whether, you know, it, it, I, you know I, I'd be happy to call for legislation for this. It seems like maybe an agenda item first to just talk about it, whether we think it merits legislation. Um, this is not the time, but discussion I think. Discussion item. What's that? Yeah. We can add a discussion. I yeah. Think. So, because it's a minor change, but we it's to our rules of council. Um, I hate to even say it because it's almost spring, but we did have a snow. I missed it. I was out of town. But I, I joke, snow in Oxford's like Groundhog Day. We have the same conversations over and over again about, hey, can't we clear the sidewalks better? And what about, and I just got an email from a constituent that said, oh, this, the sidewalk in front of this business that happens to sell salt. Uh, is an, a sheet of ice, and, and this person has a disabled child, and it was just like, well, can't we do anything about it in the city? And I go like this. 
because six years on council, we've been talking about it, and, 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 and you can start to hear all the reasons why things can't be done. Um, we, we talked about a business improvement district, a special improvement district. Do we have the, you know, could we enforce? And then all the conversations about is this, if you shovel, are you liable? And we put stuff up on the website. But I guess this points back to even if we've kind of gotten tired and started to think, oh, there's nothing we can do, it's still a problem. <laughs> The southern side of Main, the southern side of High Street is, is still a sheet of ice this morning. Uh, it's still a problem. I mean, interestingly, this is where I would think about with a comprehensive plan. Our comprehensive plan has some items. This was actually an item that rose up in the comprehensive plan. It was not tasked to anybody because I think we're like, it's an item. But how do we deal with some of those things that are like remain problems, even if we can't right now see a pathway through and it's going to be spring, it will melt and we'll forget until next year. I hope that there's a solution to this problem and we don't give up in trying to find it, whether that's thinking what we can enforce, how we can communicate. Um, that's just my hope because I don't want to give up on Oxford being the town that just doesn't shovel in sidewalks and that's the way it's all going to be forever and ever and ever because that's disappointing to me about our town. Can I ask a question about that? Because um, my father-in-law is really good about paying someone for his property at the vet clinic. Like, it is pristine and without fail and so whenever I walk around uptown is it a would that be a duty of the property owner not the business right or who would be I assume the property owner well the, the, you know the there the, yeah there's legally no duty to I mean there's no legal duty to shovel your sidewalks we do have an ordinance and I don't know whether it would bear on the business it's probably on the property owner the ordinance that we have, I think it, if we I would ever remember enforce it off the top of my head but it's probably the responsibility I think it's property owner it's yeah. a property owner, and it's, it's an ordinance that's popular, but enforcement is very hard. Is, is there a fine that could, is associated with it or no? I, I don't know. know. I didn't yeah. know we were going to discuss this or oh. I would have done a little bit. Okay, more. to be yeah. continued. I just was wondering. I was like, whose fault is this? So, uh, you know, I guess it will get warm and we will forget, and then next winter it will snow again, and we're going to be like, oh. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what my suggestion is other than I'd like to believe there's a solution, and right now it seems like looking at what can be enforced is right now the only thing left still on the table. Whether we want to do that or not, or just live with the snow, so. Thanks, Dave. Um, I just want to mention three upcoming events that are community events that everybody can, if you're able, uh, take part in, that bring the community together in, in a very special way. The first one is the Kiwanis Chili Supper, which is Thursday, February 29th. So if you want to mark your calendar for that, it's a really good event. Um, so you can get out and um, have some homemade chili, various different kinds. And um, it's like the pancake breakfast. It's, it's a way people come together and break bread together. The NAACP Freedom Fund Banquet is on Friday, April 19th. And it's not too early to mark your calendar for that. It's something that I think a lot of us in the past have really enjoyed going to, community event. And it's going to be back in Schreiber Center, which I think will be a, a good change. Um, and the Kiwanis Pancake Day, if you want to set your uh, calendar for that, is Saturday, April 20th, so the day after the Freedom Fund Banquet. So you can have dinner with the NAACP and then have breakfast in the morning with, with Kiwanis and the rest of the community. Um, with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The meeting is adjourned.